Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eduardo Peñalver. I'm the Alan R. Tesler Dean of Cornell Law School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual gathering to discuss a very important report on a crucial topic confronting our country. Recruiting for the future, a realistic road to a points tested visa program in the United States was written by Cornell's own Stevie Allaire and Mackenzie Eason with generous support from the Koch Foundation for which we're very grateful. We had originally planned to have this launch celebration in person in Washington, DC. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic had plans of its own, and so we're gathering here today virtually. Uh, while I'd always rather celebrate in person, I hope that the virtual nature of this gathering allows us to reach a broader audience and that in doing so will enhance the impact of this important report. This report is the culmination of a year-long research effort by Steve and Mac. It's also the inaugural effort of the Cornell Law School Immigration Law and Policy Program. It highlights Cornell Law School's strength in immigration law and policy research and analysis. Cornell Law School's faculty have been at the forefront in responding to many immigration related issues over the past few years, collaborating uh, among our asylum clinic, our farm worker legal assistance clinic, our First Amendment clinic. Cornell Law School faculty have represented children separated from their parents at the border, They've worked with Cornell students to help them secure and maintain their DACA status. They've provided countless information sessions to members of the Cornell and Ithaca communities and beyond. And they've convened gatherings of policymakers and activists from across the political spectrum to discuss an issue that's become no less vital during this global pandemic. And to the contrary, uh, the pandemic reveals how the mobility of goods and people in our interconnected world binds our fates together, whether we like it or not. In light of this, it's all the more notable and prescient that Cornell Law School's focus on immigration law and policy is matched at the university level by an interdisciplinary focus on migration as part of the university's Grand Challenges Initiative. As the university has noted, uh, Cornell is uniquely poised to be a global leader in migration studies. Our broad ranging and distinctive expertise spanning multiple academic units enables us to study and teach migration from different perspectives, disciplinary approaches, spatio-temporal scales, and socio-ecological contexts. The report we're celebrating today is further proof of Cornell's unique position to contribute to our understanding of migration writ large. That it does so by engaging with law and policy in such concrete ways is also quintessentially Cornell. Cornell's commitment to scholarship that engages with policy that seeks to make a difference in the world is deeply connected to Cornell's identity as the land-grant university for New York State. We hope this report will not just gather dust on a bookshelf, but that Congress will seriously consider this proposal as a way to begin to fix our broken immigration system. On our panel for this launch event webinar, we have four distinguished immigration policy experts who have, who have firsthand experience advocating for, negotiating, and designing immigration policy. Two of our panelists are form, former senior immigration aides, one for the late Ted Kennedy and one and the other for Florida Senator Marco Rubio two of the more persistent voices for immigration reform on Capitol Hill over the past few decades. The other two are policy experts who currently hold leadership roles in two of the most influential advocacy organizations in immigration policy today. Thank you for signing in today. I hope you enjoy what is sure to be a lively and informative discussion. Uh, before I turn things over to the panelists, I'd like to briefly introduce the authors of the report we're discussing today. <clears throat> Stevie Allaire is a professor of immigration practice at Cornell Law School. He's one of the country's leading experts on immigration law and policy and is the co-author of Immigration Law and Procedure, the leading 21 volume treatise on US immigration law, as well as numerous other books and articles on the subject. He teaches immigration and asylum law at Cornell Law School as a professor of immigration practice and is of counsel at Miller Mayer in Ithaca, where he also founded and was the original executive director of Invest in the USA, a trade association of EB-5 immigrant investor regional centers. Professor Yale Lair received both his undergraduate and law degrees at Cornell. Mackenzie Eason is a postdoctoral associate at Cornell Law School's Migration and Human Rights Program, where he works alongside Professor Yale Lair, examining the rise and spread of points-based economic immigration systems around the world. In addition to this research in comparative immigration law, Mr. Eason also writes on international legal history and international criminal law. As a doctoral candidate in the Department of Political Science at UCLA, He's writing his dissertation on the intertwined histories of international criminal justice and European imperialism, and his work in, on contemporary practices in international criminal prosecutions has appeared 
in the European Journal of International Law. And I will now turn over the virtual floor to Professor Steve Yellaire. Dean Penyavra, thanks for those kind remarks. Michelle, if you could advance the slide uh, to the overview slide, that would be great. Welcome to this hot topic on a hot day. Um, certainly there's a lot of interest in points-based systems now, and we're happy to tell you what we think should work in the United States. Here's what we're gonna cover in the next 55 minutes or so. First, we'll give you sort of an overview of the research that we've done and our proposal. Then we'll turn it over to our panelists uh, and ask them some pointed questions and ask them to give us some pointed answers to see whether this is a realistic proposal or not. Then we will have a Q&A with you all. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them now or during the course of the next hour in the question function of Zoom. This webinar is being recorded and we'll make the slide deck available on our website in the next few days. Our report is already up on our website. Next slide, please. So let me introduce the panelists. Dean Penelope has already done that to a certain extent, but let me give you a little more color about each of them. In alphabetical order, uh, Teresa Cardinal Brown is Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy for the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, DC. She formerly served as Director of the Immigration Legislation Task Force in the Department of Homeland Security Office of Policy. She's also been a policy advisor to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and the Director of Immigration Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Next, Enrique Gonzalez is Managing Partner of Fragman Worldwide in their Miami office. He's a Cornell Law School graduate, for which we're very grateful, and he formerly served as Special Counsel on Immigration to U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. Next is Esther Olivaria. Uh, she has served in several senior positions of the Department of Homeland Security and the White House Domestic Policy Council. And as the Dean mentioned, she was counsel to Sedward, Senator Edward Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And last but certainly not least, Executive Director of the New American Economy, Jeremy Robbins is here. He heads up a bipartisan coalition of more than 500 CEOs and mayors making the economic case for immigration reform. Jeremy formerly served as policy advisor and special counsel in the office of New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Next slide, please. So why did we decide to work on this research proposal? Well, I've had a long standing interest in immigration point systems. Back in 1994, um, before there was a Migration Policy Institute, there was the Carnegie Endowment on, for International Peace that had an immigration program. And I co-authored a book with Dimitri Papadimitriou about immigration point systems as they existed then um, and how we might shape one for the United States. Uh, fast forward 20 some years and here we are again. The United States has not uh, had its own immigration point systems, but as you'll hear in a minute, many more countries now do have immigration point systems. And I wanted to try to find out how those systems have evolved over the last 20 some years and how they might work in the United States. Next slide, please. So let's give you just sort of a very cursory 30,000 foot executive summary of our report and our proposal. Uh, we think that a immigration point system can be a good addition to the US immigration system. We do not plan to take away any current green cards. We do propose that uh, the immigration point system in our report would be an additional 50,000 green cards a year, which is really only about 4% of the current green card total. Um, we think that this could help solve a lot of problems in our current immigration system. And let's go to the next slide and start to talk about this in a little more detail. We think we need uh, an immigration point system for several reasons. First, for pressure relief. The current U.S. immigration system is failing U.S. employers in the country in a variety of ways. These failures are likely to become more serious in the near future as the U.S. economy and the labor market change in the face of challenges from COVID, from automation, an aging workforce, and the growing skills mismatches across sectors and geographic regions. There's ample evidence, as you'll hear, that even a moderate increase in skilled immigration would certainly benefit the country. And existing skilled visa programs <clears throat> are backlogged and capped far below market demand. So our proposed program would relieve some of this pressure on existing visa programs by adding new numbers. 
In terms of proof of concept, points-tested immigration programs have been successful, primarily in Canada and Australia, but also in other countries. But we can't just copy and paste their systems here in the United States. We're significantly different in terms of our size, our governmental structure, and our political climate. Many people are skeptical of the idea that a point system can work in the United States. And so what we're offering is sort of a low cost, low risk way to test this premise. It would be a small pilot program over 10 years. That way, questions about whether a point system could work in the United States would, could be explored in a real world setting and could be addressed in a staged manner. And then we could decide whether to scale up to decide whether to have more employment-based immigration go through the point system or not. Third, we think our proposal would solve a policy gap. Right now, the United States' existing employment-based visa programs, both temporary and permanent, are oriented toward meeting the immediate labor needs of U.S. employers. But there are two problems with doing that. First, the interests of U.S. employers are not necessarily identical to the interests of the United States as a country, or of its residents. Second, the elected lawmakers charged with setting U.S. immigration policy have a fiduciary duty to provide not only for the short-term needs of particular companies, but also for the country's long-term economic success and health. Currently, our existing employment-based programs are not suited to address these problems. So our pilot program, we think, would fill this gap. We would have the existing labor certification system still exist but we would add something that would look more toward future long-term human capital needs of the United States. On to the next slide. So we say, let's focus by starting this points-based proposal on skilled immigrants, which we define in our report as people working in jobs that require at least a four-year degree or equivalent. The economic basis for this is clear. Skilled immigrants create jobs. Sometimes they do that directly, like when a foreign entrepreneur starts a company here in the United States. Sometimes they do it indirectly by contributing to the success of an existing US company or by adding to demand for local goods and services. One study, for example, by the National Foundation for American Policy found that for every one additional high-skilled H-1B worker hired by a US firm, five to seven new domestic jobs are created in that industry. Another study found that for each U.S. educated foreign worker that is added to the U.S. economy, that foreign worker creates more than two jobs for U.S. workers. Also, skilled immigration boosts the wages of U.S. workers. A recent survey of 219 U.S. cities found that increases in temporary skilled work in STEM fields, science, technology, education, and math, created wage increases of 7 to 8 percent for native-born workers. So let's go on to the next slide and talk about why a point system, and then I'll turn it over to Mac. What is a point system? A point system is simply an immigration system that uses points to assess individuals' applications for admission. And there are a variety of ways you can assess points. You can look at education level, employment experience, familiarity with the receiving country, or prearranged employment. The policymakers decide which points are most important. And then you collect those in a points table, sort of like a grading rubric in schools that guides the evaluation of each visa program. Points-based systems are also sometimes called merit-based immigration or skill-based immigration or talent-based immigration. They all can mean more or less the kinds of things that we're talking about, in which candidates for immigration are selected at least in part on the basis of their skills, talents, or training, or other human capital attributes, and they're selected go through the state rather than simply have employers do that. This is just one of many policy tools that can be used to administer an immigration program. What I like about point systems is that they are transparent. The criteria and the points values are set in advance and made available not just to immigration officers, but also to the public and to aspiring immigrants. This transparency reduces uncertainty costs, allowing them to have a good sense of whether they'll qualify for a visa. So how do we know the point systems work? Mac, let me turn it over to you in the next slide. Thank you, Steve. 
Uh, we know that point systems work because we've done a whole uh, year worth of research on it. Um, so points-based systems are, are be currently being used in a number of different countries around the world. Um, Canada was the first state to implement a points-based selection system in 1967 as part of an effort to attract larger numbers of skilled foreign workers to meet the growing needs of its domestic labor market. Uh, currently, there are 11 uh, countries or semi-autonomous territories that use a points-based selection system in one or more of their economic visa programs. These include Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Aus Austria, Singapore, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Japan, and South Korea. There are two more countries, uh, Turkey and Mexico, that have passed legislation laying the groundwork for a point system, and Germany just finished running a three-year-long points-tested pilot program. There are only three countries, so far as we're aware, that have repealed the points-based immigration system after it had been fully implemented, the UK, the Czech Republic, and Denmark. Uh, it should be noted, though, that there have been recent efforts to revive the point systems in two of those states. Um, Another element that we found in our, years, our year worth of research is that uh, point systems employed in, in these various countries uh, vary in a number of respects. So some are used to administer only one visa program, which is more or less the model that we're going for. Uh, some are used to sort applications across five or more visa programs. Some states have even set up multiple separate point systems, each tailored to a single visa program. Uh, some are used in uh, visa programs aimed at high skill born workers, other aim, are aim, others are aimed at uh, medium skilled or, or skilled trades, or even low skilled workers. Uh, some, like the one used in New Zealand's points-based parent visa program, are even used to manage visa programs that fall outside of employment-based immigration altogether. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So what we, what we learned a couple things from this uh, survey of, of point systems around the world. Uh, the first one is that uh, point systems are remarkably effective at attracting foreign workers. Uh, in a 2017 study discussed in more detail in our Canada chapter, uh, Zyka and Parsons found that countries that operate points-based skills visa programs attract an average of 1.5 times the number of high-skilled uh, migrants as countries that lack such programs. Um, Canada and Australia, two of these the, the countries that operate these, attract a higher proportion of skilled foreign labor than would be projected based on their size and economic opportunities alone. So thus, combined with the U.S.'s re recent efforts to reduce skilled immigration into this country, uh, their systems have resulted in Canada and Australia attracting many foreign workers that may otherwise have been, brought their talents and tax dollars to the U.S. Another element that we learned was that point systems uh, are, are more than capable of coexisting with uh, employer-led visa programs. So the point systems in Canada and Australia manage the majority of these countries' employer-based immigration. But if we look across other countries' uses of point systems, we can see that uh, point system can, in many cases, are uh, used in conjunction with employer-driven visa programs. So none of the point systems in China, the Netherlands, Austria, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, or South Korea are nearly as large as Canada and Australia in terms of the number of visas they issue um, uh, or the number of visa programs they are used in. Many of these countries have adopted point systems for one or two or three economic programs, uh, economic visa programs that exist alongside a much larger set of uh, visa programs that are driven more by employer demand or other selection factors. Let's jump to the next slide. So this brings us to a discussion of what exactly is in our proposal. We lay out our proposal uh, in detail in chapter five of our report, but just some of the highlights here, we're calling for uh, Congress to create a new points tested visa program. It would be established as a 10 year pilot program. They would be allocated 50,000 permanent visas or green cards per year. It's important to note here, uh, these 50,000 green cards in our proposal would be in addition to the current yearly total. Our proposal doesn't make any changes to existing visa categories. In other words, it doesn't take any uh, green cards, any permanent visas away from, say, Family Stream or the Diversity Visa Lottery. Um, put another way, our proposal is meant to supplement existing visa programs, not to undermine or reduce them. Another aspect of our proposal, it would be a single application stream managed through a two-stage expression of interest uh, ap application process. Um, this is a, a term of art. It's used, it's a, it's a new form of uh, kind of managing a point system that has been adopted by Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. Um, 
the points rubric, that the, the points table, the kind of distribution of uh, how many points are granted for what factor, would be weighted towards longer term human capital factors, such as educational attainment, age, experience, teamwork, and linguistic abilities. Uh, Oversight, we would include a number of administrative elements that would support this program, such as uh, oversight guidelines and infrastructure capable of gathering and storing administrative data on admissions and applications, as well as long-term longitudinal data on economic and social outcomes. Uh, lawmakers could use this not only to map out uh, other, as other areas of immigration policy, but also to update and tweak this system as necessary. Uh, a regular policy review process under which the current admission policies and post-entry integration and support policies would be examined using current labor market data and economic and societal integration outcome data regarding past year's immigration cohorts. And the last support we have here is we call for a standing advisory board to be created consisting of experts, policymakers, and other stakeholders, including policy experts in economics, public policy, uh, immigration, uh, and civil servants with experience in administering uh, the United States or other countries and immigration systems. This advisory board would help lawmakers with uh, complicated issues that require a deeper expertise uh, and would be able to provide uh, guidance on those issues. Um, let's jump to the next slide. On this slide, we have the points table, that grading rubric that we have proposed. Uh, it shows you exactly what the factors are that, uh, that our program would award points uh, for. Um, because our total possible value here is a multiple of 10, it's relatively easy to convert the maximum point values here to percentages and to thereby get a sense of the weight and thus relative importance that we place on each factor. So the most heavily weighted factor here is education, making up 25% of the total possible points. This is if we take into account uh, the 200 points that were allocated that can be allocated based on the highest uh, terminal degree that an applicant has uh, achieved, as well as a, uh, a bonus for having achieved a, a, a degree in the United States. The next most heavily weighted factor will be employability at 20% of the total. Again, this is 150 points for uh, work experience and then an additional uh, bonus for having uh, had work experience here in the United States. Below that, um, we, have, we start to have some factors that we think are relatively unique. So we have 20% uh, for be allocated to family support. Here, we grant 100 points each uh, to on the one hand, candidates who have a spouse, partner, or close family member that will be applying for a U.S. visa alongside the primary applicant here. Uh, this is a reward, uh, an incentive uh, to, to um, encourage applicants to um, come with their spouses with an element of uh, family support that can help them uh, when they move here. Um, we also grant 100 points Based, uh, granted to candidates who have a spouse or partner or close family member that are already living here in the U.S. Again, both of these are different aspects of um, rewarding and incentivizing uh, um, uh, applicants that have a base of family support when they uh, get here to the U.S. Moving on, we have language proficiency uh, at 15%. Um, it is not at all uncommon across most um, point systems that uh, language proficiency, especially in English, is uh, included in, in many of them. Uh, we added in, uh, if you note here, one third of the points under the language proficiency uh, category are granted on the basis of not on the applicant's uh, proficiency in a language, in, in the dominant language here in the U.S. English, uh, but in their proficiency in a language other than English, because we take it to be the case that uh, linguistic diversity is a uh, is a human capital good that we uh, in, in the global economy need here in the US. And then finally, we have two demographic characteristics that we uh, grant additional points to. Um, the first is uh, we grant 50 points to applicants that are nationals of a developing country. Uh, this, is to, this, this category is to, uh, to help us um, uh, prevent having a cohort of, of entrants uh, being made up entirely of, say, uh, European or, or, uh, or otherwise um, overrepresented groups. Uh, similarly, we have 50 points for the, if, if the applicant identifies as non-male. Um, 
there is significant research in the academic literature suggesting that point systems uh, in general can, if not uh, carefully designed, result in uh, built-in structural biases towards uh, men, towards uh, uh, nationals of developing countries, uh, towards uh, white applicants. So this is, we've built in these kind of demographic characteristics as an explicit counterweight. And this is something we hadn't seen in really any other uh, um, proposal that we had seen so far. Okay, All right. let's go to the next slide yeah. and talk about the merits of our proposal. So we do have some unique features, but in many ways our proposal isn't all that novel. Uh, our points rubric is similar to point systems that have been contained in past immigration bills introduced in Congress. And the system that we're proposing is modeled on the systems now used in Australia and Canada. The main difference in our proposal lies in its intentional modesty in size, scope, strategy, and structure, or what we call the four S's. Size, this would only apply to 50,000 green cards a year, just about 4% of overall yearly immigration to the US. Scope, we don't plan on making any changes to existing immigration categories. Strategy, uh, we propose that Congress enact this pilot program as a standalone bill rather than as part of a comprehensive immigration reform package to make it easier to get through Congress. And structure, we recommend establishing this as a pilot program to allow people to sort of assess whether it really works or not. Let's go to the next slide. We think our proposal would be legislatively achievable, programmatically successful, and popular. In terms of popularity, roughly eight in 10 US adults survey, surveyed in a recent poll supported policies that encourage highly skilled people to immigrate and work to the United States. We also think it's low cost and low risk because of the small number of green cards per year, the fact that it's a pilot program. And we think it's less controversial than other programs that have been proposed in the past because we're not proposing any changes or reductions to existing visa programs. And we think that being designed as a standalone bill that might have a slightly better chance of getting through Congress than as part of immigration reform. So with that, let's conclude uh, there you see a reference on the next slide to where you can find our report, and we'll repeat that on the final slide. But let's go turn to our panelists, because this is where really the rubber meets the road. Um, you all have been very um, knowledgeable and experienced in thinking about these systems. Let me start with you, Teresa, with the first question, but if other panelists want to jump in on any of these questions, feel free to do so. So, Teresa. You certainly have read our working draft several times. What do you think are the strongest and weakest parts of our proposal? Uh, well, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Mac, and thank you to the Cornell Law School for inviting me to participate in this. Um, you know, I think first I should acknowledge that, as you mentioned, Stephen, points-based system discussion in the United States has been around for a very long time, right? Um, you know, your, your book, which actually sits on my shelf at work uh, with Dimitri in 96, um, you know, going back to even like the Immigration Commission in the late 70s, early 80s, fiddled about with the idea of a points-based system and decided against recommending it. We've had a few different bills that have been introduced uh, types of, of, of points-based systems, but none of them ha have passed. And there's a lot of political and policy reasons for that. I think one big thing that we have to recognize whenever we're talking about something like this is that it is such a fundamental substantive change from how our, you know, how our immigration system has operated for our entire history. I mean, our most recent immigration changes in 65 and 90 um, still prioritized sponsorship, whether it's family sponsorship or employer sponsorship, rather than self-sponsorship uh, of, of immigration. Um, that I think there's a devil you know problem. And for policy people like us, we tend to dive straight into the weeds about how's this going to function and who's it's going to impact and who's going to, who, who might qualify in our current system, who wouldn't under a new system and who might be the new people that come in. And so we dive straight down to that. And that sort of, I think, obfuscates a, a bigger picture of why would we want to do this at all. And so I think one of the benefits of thinking about this now is that there is widespread acknowledgement in the United States at the moment that our current immigration system is just broken. 
And it actually doesn't matter what side of the issue you come from or what party you come from. The vast majority of people in the United States would say that the current immigration system is broken. So without some sort of fundamental change to that system, we're not fixing anything. Uh, if we're just sort of rehashing or uh, tweaking our existing system, we're probably not enacting the kind of substantive changes that I think a lot of people in the United States are looking for. So the time may be very ripe to consider something that's not new, but would be a radical change from how we do things. And your proposal to do it, you know, in a smaller way and try it out may be the best way to overcome that sort of devil you know problem, is that we allow ourselves an ability to try it out. The other benefits of this kind of system, I think you mentioned a little bit in your presentation, is that it's transparent, it's understandable, and it does express a certain type of goal, which is we want to attract high-skilled immigrants to the United States. That's a clear-cut goal. One of the reasons that a lot of Americans don't support our current immigration system is they don't understand what it's for. They don't uh, see the goals of it, they only see the outcomes of it, and they're not sure those outcomes are the right ones for the United States in whatever way, whether it's backlogs in the family-based category or decades-long delays in getting an immigrant sponsorship, or even if you believe there are too many immigrants total. It's, it's just that not understanding the system. Uh, most Americans have no interaction with the U.S. immigration system, so they don't understand how complicated it is. So they either underestimate its complexity and therefore overestimate the ability of immigrants to navigate it, or they find it so co incredibly complex that they can't understand what it's for. So one of the benefits of these points-based systems is their transparency, the explicitness of the goals, and that it's easily understood by everybody who looks at it, whether it's an American, an employer, an immigrant looking to come here, a policymaker, an advocate, everybody can look at it and understand what it's for and what it's doing. In terms of implementation, um, it takes a lot of the kind of uncertainty and discretion out of the adjudication process. A lot of space in our federal register right now is dedicated to describing in minute detail the various adjudicative decisions that our immigration authorities have to make in every visa application. Um, how to evaluate a, a degree, uh, how to determine what the prevailing wage is, uh, all of these kinds of things that are really, really complicated uh, uh, issues of adjudication um, that immigration officers are expected to just somehow know. And what you get is a wide variety in actual implementation of adjudication. So there's a lot of discrepancy from one adjudication to another, even for the same job at the same company, where the two people with very similar backgrounds can have different adjudicative outcomes. This eliminates all of that and makes it much simpler for the adjudicative aspect and probably can get rid of a bunch of pages of regulations <laughs> up front. Um, so if you're looking for a smaller government footprint, that may work. The flip side of that is all the adjudicative resources may be less. In order to properly figure out exactly how to allocate the points and what kinds of long-term capital you're looking for, that requires a lot of data and a lot of expertise and a lot of decision-making that is somewhat subjective in terms of figuring out what is it the United States wants and needs. And that's how you put it into the points-based system. So I think there are, you know, just fundamentally in the designs, there are some really positives. Um, there are, you know, a lot of political questions to be answered about whether or not we're ready for this kind of thing. But I think that it is a good time to examine this type of system and figure out if there is a way that we can make it work in the United States. Because I do feel like if we can create a system that the American public can understand, that they can see what the outcomes are likely to be, that they can believe that those outcomes are positive for immigrants and for the United States, then you'll have a lot greater support for not just the system, but hopefully the immigrants who come in through that system. And that can create a better consensus in this country around what we need to do with immigration. Thank you, Teresa. So Esther, Teresa was talking about uh, the merits on the substance, but there's certainly the politics. And you've been around Washington for so many years. You've had a lot of experience working on immigration legislation, both in the Senate and for the administration. What do you see as sort of the pain points 
uh, from both the left and the right to this kind of proposal? Well, again, thank you, um, Steve and Mac, um, for the opportunity to participate in this panel. And um, I wanted to commend you on, on the thought that you put into this paper. Um, Steve, as you know, when we talked oh, many months ago, February, another lifetime ago, about uh, this point system, I, I said that I had always had serious concerns about point systems, um, but that I would read your paper with an open mind, and I have. And, and I, 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 um, I think that the two of you put lots of thought in, in looking at the concerns that have been raised in the past with point systems. Um, and, um, and the fact that uh, they've been, at least in 2007 and 2013, replaced um, the existing structure altogether. Um, and, and that that is, is problematic from, from my standpoint. Um, so you, you come at it with a much more gradual approach um, and you look at you know, the concerns that have been raised in the past with respect to women, with respect to um, people coming from less developed countries, those kinds of things. Um, I like the idea of a mandatory review um, and um, I think that a standing um, immigration advisory board is long overdue. Um, that said, <laughs> I, I, I still think that this, and I can speak more from, from how Democrats would look at this versus Republicans would look at it. I, I can venture into that world a little bit, but um, Democrats have always looked at a point system as, as um, in the elitist structure uh, because it, it, um, it gives the most points to people with the highest degrees. PhDs, for example, outright get 100 points, and if uh, graduated from a U.S. Um, university, there's 50 more points. Proficiency in English, again, a lot more points. Um, and so um, workers that have, you know, uh, lower skills that are as needed in this country wouldn't benefit from this kind of point system. Um, I, I take issue with um, the, the evaluation of, you know, uh, the kinds of people that would be that qualify to come into this country is those who would contribute most to the success of this country and in the long term. And I think that if you look at the history of our country, lower skilled um, um, immigrants have contributed as much. Um, um, those who come in um, not speaking English, you know, learning English here have also contributed significantly. We've seen that. Um, today, you know, in, in this post-COVID world, um, with um, the, the many reports that have been um, that have come out on the many contributions of, of what we're now calling essential workers, recognizing how essential they are. Um, so, as that is background, I, I think that um, many Democrats are going to have a hard time supporting um, this point system, um, and and probably would only go along with it as part of a larger package. I know your goal would be to, to try to um, have this introduced and enacted as a standalone. I, I don't think that's going to happen um, in, in this country. We haven't had immigration standalone bills happen in a long, long time. I remember when I first started in Kennedy's office away in 98, we used, that used to be a, a regular um, um, occurrence, um, but that stopped long ago. Um, and probably the, the legislation that has had the most support um, in the country and in Congress, the DREAM Act, hasn't been able to pass as a standalone. So I don't see something like this, um, something this new, something this controversial passing as a standalone. You may eventually get it included in some kind of, of larger comprehensive re reform if we get to that point one day. Great. Well, Esther, thank you for those honest comments. Enrique, let me turn it to you. From the Republican side, you worked with Senator Rubio on the 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Reform Package in the Senate, the famous Gang of Eight, and you had a points-based system then. What do you think the pain points or the positive sides from the Republican perspective are in terms of actually getting something like this enacted? Well, Stephen, first, thank you so much for inviting me to participate on this panel. It's a real pleasure and an honor to participate with my alma mater who uh, is establishing itself as the thought leader in academia uh, on immigration policy issues. 
With regards to, to your proposal uh, and, and the positive aspects and how to move it along, first I would add that this is that document that I wish I would have found in 2013 when I was uh, um, negotiating uh, up against uh, Leon Fresco uh, for every aspect of the, uh, of the legislation that made it through the Senate. Um, we uh, shot from the hip a little bit on, on, on the points-based system. And so this gives us that level of detail, not that it didn't exist in other documents, but there were no current documents or at least nothing that I could find. And I would sneak out of the, out of the Senate every few days and go to a few different organizations, uh, policy institutes to get some of their um, academic literature uh, to try to be able to better uh, talk about this issue. We also even called on colleagues who had developed the systems or helped develop the systems in Australia and in the UK, but it never got to the level of detail um, and thought that you all put into it. And we also tried to cram it within a less than 90 day window to drop the legislation. Putting that aside, that, that was the context of what we were trying to achieve. Um, what I do see is a, a number of, of great examples of that thought process and why this from a practical perspective has more of a chance than the, the portion that we carved out. Now, what we did in 2013 is we carved out um, because of the, of the backdrop of no additional immigrant visas under the annual quota, so we could not increase the 140,000, we had to go ahead and carve it out and take away a family program, take away the diversity lottery program, just where the diversity lottery program would get us to the numbers you would need right now. There was some pushback on that side, but at the end of the day, uh, given all the other horse trading that was going on during the process, we were able to get it in. Now, let's take the first issue. The first issue is standalone or comprehensive. And I, I um, with all respect to Esther, I'll never forget, Esther was one of the first people I met in Washington, DC. I was told by my colleagues in Miami, you need to meet her as soon as you get to DC on your assignment in 2013. And I remember down in the little Senate cafeteria, Esther, that you and I had coffee and uh, you gave me some sage words of wisdom, um, which I, I will cherish and, and keep to, uh, with me to this day because uh, they helped me well uh, during my tenure that year there. But um, contrary to what Esther's perspective is, and, and I respect it very much because she's been doing this even longer than I have, is that I think that comprehensive immigration reform is doomed uh, in the current political climate. Um, the, the only chance would be, I think, and we had this opportunity under the Obama administration where both chambers and the White House will be controlled by one political party. That is the only way that there's a potential for comprehensive or standalone legislation. So I agree with her that the issue of standalone legislation not having passed in decades, um, that is a significant hurdle to overcome, but I think it is one that can be overcome if there is that significant political change. Now, uh, as we get down, as Teresa was pointing out, the devil is in the details. Um, the, the, this is where I think you can get some agreement, not complete, but some agreement that a points-based system would bode well for the United States as part, one element of a greater system, not a system all by itself. So I think that's the one thing that we have to uh, accept is that there would be great difficulty. Now, there are some uh, portions of the Republican Party that that's what they want the immigration system to become completely, is a points-based only system. But there are still elements of the Republican Party, as well as some elements in the Democrats that they, um, and, and independents, who would prefer to see it as one portion of a, of a bigger program. So the first thing of uh, independent or, or standalone legislation or comprehensive immigration, I'm of the party, I'm of the thought that it needs to go standalone legislation. But again, it's going to be a byproduct of who's in control of the government. Do you have all three elements, uh, necessary elements in the legislative process uh, as part of the same group? Now, we had this during Obama, and some would say that the Obama administration blew their opportunity to have gotten comprehensive immigration reform uh, in place when they did control uh, uh, all three aspects. And so that's the first thing. But the reason that comprehensive will be more difficult is because there are some elements of the D Democrat Party and the Republican Party who, when they, if you stretch them far back enough, they will uh, eventually coincide in their thought process. Um, it, it's, um, it, it is the reality of that some things like right, the current COVID crisis bring us to. Now, with that said, you have the politics. What aspects I think that um, I think you still have to overcome is the issue of, especially right now uh, in COVID, and, and perhaps for the foreseeable year or two, as to whether adding an additional 50,000 will be a viable 
uh, opportunity versus substituting something out, something that may not have as significant of a support as the diversity immigrant visa lottery. Now, there is a number of groups that definitely support that. It's an equal opportunity uh, type program. Um, but on the Republican side, uh, I think you're going to have a, a greater difficulty um, making headway to get this in there and, and move it along. Now, in the current climate that we're in politically, one chamber, Democrat, one chamber, uh, uh, Republican in the uh, White House controlled by the Republicans, uh, it is a much more difficult push. I, I think this is something that gives everyone the outline that, they're, that they need in order to be able to articulate um, what are the elements of the program, but also taking the consideration that Australia's program, UK's program, Canada's program, um, look at them in a, in a microcosm because they were implemented in countries which were much smaller than, our, um, uh, than the United States. So summing it up, I think really at the end of the day, the, the product itself, incredible, well thought, well, well uh, articulated uh, document, which will be, in my opinion, the outline uh, for generations to come on this particular issue. I think this is gonna be setting that standard for, for the future. From a political perspective, however, I, I think that um, there is a, a completely different document that needs to be drafted on how to maneuver um, something like this through the political process, because uh, one thing is certain, you're never going to satisfy everyone. And as Esther pointed out, beyond the policy wonks in Washington, such as myself, who are really interested in this detail, or Teresa pointed, I apologize, pointed out that the, 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 the mass in America don't necessarily understand how difficult immigration is and how it works, but it's going to really be at the end of the day, um, controlled and determined by a smaller group of individuals who are going to be the politicians who we need to help convince that this is the wave of the future, not by itself, though. It has to be a component, but not a standalone, standalone legislation, but not standalone program or, or process. Great. So, Jeremy, I'd like to get your views. You've thought a lot about this, and I'd like to get your views both on the Proposal itself, uh, particularly Esther's comment that this is too elitist. We've tried to address that in certain ways by adding other factors, but maybe you think it's also too elitist. And then I'd also like your comments on the politics. You know, what do you see as the way to try to uh, thread the needle to possibly get this enacted in Congress? Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Mac, and it's great to be here today. Um, look, I, I, we spent the last three years trying to wrap our heads around a, a point system um, and, and I think there are huge benefits to a point system, but I also think there, there are enormous hurdles, many of which, um, especially Esther and, and, and Teresa talked about. I mean, from the, from the benefit side of this, I mean, I think there are economic benefits. I think one of the things Mac uh, alluded to a bunch, but I don't think hit on enough, is this idea of point systems invest in people, right? Teresa was talking about the idea that in our current model, someone has to sponsor you. You need some some aspect that lets you in. Well, just saying, look, let's take a holistic view of, of who we think is going to be successful. So I think that from a long-term economic view uh, is a benefit of point system. I think politically, um, another thing Teresa mentioned, which I think is hugely important, is when you talk to them, it's not just that it's complicated, um, why immigration is such a challenging issue for Americans. It's that when you talk to most Americans, they think that our immigration system is just about immigrants. They don't think it's about America. So a point system that frames immigration as, are you going to contribute, has that benefit of reframing the system in a way you can talk to Americans about it. So I, so I think that's fabulous. Um, and then from a policy point of view, I think you, it, it also can be, whether, when it's designed well, really flexible, right? You don't need necessarily Congress to act. You can, in some sense, why it works well in, in parliamentary systems is you can give out some of the responsibility to meet if the economy changes, if our needs change, um, I think that's one of the huge flaws of our current immigration system is that we give out the same number of visas, whether we're in recession or we're in boom time. Well, that makes absolutely no sense when you think about uh, the economic side. Having said that, I think there's some real hurdles with a point system. And I think Esther got at a lot of these. I mean, I think just the frame of a point system of suggesting there are good immigrants versus bad immigrants leads to this notion and, and to drive some of that elitism. Um, and I think some of this is driven partly by this idea of this is, in, in theory, a pilot system. So we're trying to prove this idea that this is going to be successful. But it's really hard to think about what success means here, right? What, what, when people think about our immigration system, 
the economic success of the immigrants who come through it isn't necessarily the only goal, right? We want to reunite families. We want to add to the diversity and strength of this country. Uh, we want to show people that this matters. I mean, one of the realities of immigration is that for we are constantly fighting this role of immigration is not always popular. And if people, even when people think that immigration is a good thing, they're, they're culturally anxious and they're easily born off it. Um, and so let's say this is successful. How do you scale it? How do you answer the hard questions of how do you accomplish family and diversity in a point system? How do you think about race, especially in this particular moment in having a point system that, 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 that values this idea of plurality and we want to bring in people from around the world and is not elite in the way she says it. And um, how do you think about things like artists or priests or other people who contribute in ways that are economic? And, and so having a discrete pilot program, you sort of kick a lot of those questions down the road. So even if the people who come through this are successful, does that mean when you're done with your 10 years, you won't have gotten any closer to asking those questions? You will have gotten over what I think Teresa's first led with, which is this idea of this is so different and now people understand that a point system isn't so different. But I actually think that's the smaller of the hurdles that you face with a point system. The bigger one is how do you define contribution in a way that recognizes we need a lot more lower, lesser skilled individuals, not just higher skilled individuals. And we want to build in diversity as a strength. We want to protect families. And so I think, um, I think this is a fabulous idea if we could pass a, a discrete program to show that point system works. I think that is a, a real additive. But I don't think it gets at the high, higher political problems or even the policy problems of bringing in a point system generally. Great. Well, thank you for all those comments. Any uh, follow-up comments from any of the panelists on what other panelists have said? Teresa, why don't you start? Yeah, I just want to weigh in a little bit. I think what Jeremy said is also important. I think, you know, you've on purpose focused on high skilled immigration. And if you look at the points based systems in the world, they clearly prioritize high skilled immigration because they see high skilled immigration as the most beneficial and high skilled immigrants as the most likely to integrate well over time for the country. It's also, if you will, politically easier in many ways to support high skilled immigration. It's a lot politically harder to support lesser skilled immigration in, in a lot of ways. But yet, if you look at how our system is broken, uh, the high skilled system is not great by any means, but it's working better than our lesser skilled migration programs in the United States. So in terms of what really needs fixing, um, that's something that we need to figure out. And it may be that you can adapt some form of a points-based system that would also apply to lesser skilled immigrants, or you have a different type of system that works for middle skill or lesser skilled immigrants. Again, the countries that you mentioned don't have one sole mechanism, right? Uh, that the point system can accommodate in different ways, different types of visa streams, and it may be one of a multitude of different visa streams. So I think, you know, one of the fallacies in the way that merit-based immigration is described in the United States, at least in the current political dialogue, is that it's sort of a single answer to everything. And I think that's incorrect. I think a points-based system, we're talking about merit-based immigration, can solve some of the broken problems of our immigration system, but it's not going to solve all of them. And we need to have some different solutions for different pieces of it. So this may be a very good opening for one piece of what needs to be done, um, but is not going to be the answer to everything. And I think the, the issues that were raised by Enrique about the political push that always happens about numbers, right? At the end of the day, describe the system however you want, how many? How many people are we gonna have in? And what we have to understand is that our system has always had those numbers negotiated by Congress based on nothing more than what people think they can politically sell. It's, the numbers have never been based on any design of economic need, on any measure of demographics, uh, they have always been based on a political negotiation of, I could maybe sell an extra $50,000, 50,000 votes, or visas to my voters, um, but, or I can never sell an increase. And you have that question in polls every year about, do you support an increase, a decrease, or stay the same on our legal immigration numbers? And it's been changing over time. The number who say decrease is going down, the number say increase is going up, but guess what? 
the plurality is still keep it the same. So that political pressure is still there and the numbers game still matches up. And I would see it be very difficult for Congress to not to look at, you wanna add 50,000? Well, the easiest thing to take away is diversity because that's 50. There you go, there's your trade off. That's the easiest thing in the world to happen. And that's, that will create a, a different political fight. So the politics of immigration don't necessarily get easier based on the type of policy that you put in front of them. But I do think that we have to change the public support about immigration to help change the politics. And that's why I think the idea of a more transparent system and explaining clearly what the goals are and what it's trying to do can help change that dynamic in the long run. Great. So Esther, let me turn to you for sort of last comments, either rebutting or commenting on other comments or what you think you know you would do if you could try to get immigration reform through Congress right now, and then I'll go to Enrique after that and Jeremy after that. So I, last word from you, Esther. Yeah, I don't think I, we have enough time with respect to what it would take to get immigration reform through the Congress right now. Let me just address the, I'm um, going back to the point system and something Teresa said. Uh, our our um, employment-based um, current system, everyone agrees, is is so broken, but we, the parts that work better than others are the high skilled um, and, and um, seg segments of it. We have practically, as you all know, no visas for lower skilled workers. And one of the things I looked at before we started um, the webcast was um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, occupations with the most job growth um, through 2028. And they include personal health uh, care aid, um, food preparation, home health aid, cooks, waiters, waitresses, janitors, um, housekeepers, construction, um, yeah, landscaping, maintenance, carpenters, taxi drivers. Um, so I would, I would challenge you to go back and look at um, developing um, a pilot point system that looks at these kinds of skills also in, in other um, factors that give points for uh, things that um, would contribute to our country and our economy, um, you know, lasting contributions. Um, so I, that's, I, I'll leave you with that. Uh, one more real quick point on that. We could do that. I mean, other countries do have points programs for low skilled workers. And so we could do that as well. We just wanted to sort of try to pick what we thought was the uh, lowest hanging fruit but it may be that while we've analyzed that, we should also analyze other aspects of immigration system through a point-based lens. Enrique and then Jeremy, a minute each. Steven, thank you again. And also to Dean Peñalved and Mac for all the work uh, that you all done and also to the Koch Foundation for their support of your uh, work. Um, the, the reality here is that one size does not fit all. So for us to sit here and just assume that someone's going to pick up this document, run with it and implement it in whole, or what I would call plug and play, um, as everyone I think is, is realizes, there's going to need to be some tweaking. Esther makes a great point with regards to low skilled immigration. Uh, however, I think that in an environment with high unemployment or even uh, unemployment in the middle numbers uh, in the six, 7%, it would still be a tough push um, uh, for, for low-skilled immigration, even though that's where the need is going to be in the future. And then you have the, the history, which most people don't even recall, um, especially a person's born prior to me, my generation, the, the Bracero program from Mexico and, and what the issues that created in the long run. Um, at the end of the day, what, uh, as Teresa's pointed out, there needs to be a, a re-education of America as to what is, it, it takes. Uh, with regards to getting something done on immigration, helping them understand immigration and getting, and that's what a uh, new American economy is doing. That's what bipartisan policy Institute and MPI are also doing. And they're doing a fantastic job, but it needs to be taken up to even a different scale. Um, the, the final comment then that being said is from a political perspective, um, this is gonna be the tough push. And, I, and again, I, I go back to the prior statement I think what ends up happening is we need to look for a uniform Congress and White House where everyone is aligned uh, uh, either in the same political party or the same view. And I don't think it's ever going to happen outside of a political party uh, to move forward with something. But remembering that this is only going to be one element of the overall program by itself. Um, it, it, it could create an America that no one would want if we had just a points based system standing by itself and nothing else. 
um, it, 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 it can only be a complementary aspect uh, to, uh, to an overall program. And Jeremy, last word to you. And I'll keep it in 60 seconds. Thank you all, and, and, and this was a great discussion. Um, I think this is a very positive focus, right? I think immigration has to be about America. It can't just be about immigrants, both if we're going to make it successful from policy and a political system. Uh, and I think a point system can, can help with that. And, and so I think as a pilot, this is a fabulous thing. I think the, the, the more difficult question uh, that has been gotten at a lot during this conversation is, is then if you are going to expand it and get, how do you, how do you define contribution looking at, like Esther said, the immigrants who have actually contributed to America, who tended to become here low skilled, often not speaking English, um, and how do you think about contribution in a point system, in a broader lens that brings in your role in the community, your, the role you're adding to culture and not just the economy? Um, and I think that's going to be the challenge. And I think that's uh, a positive one to have, though. But this is a great first step, and, and I'm grateful to be here. And Teresa, why don't you give a plug for bipartisanship? Yeah, I, I just want to take a slight issue with Enrique, because we have had single party control of the White House and both houses of Congress both in Republican hands and Democratic hands, and neither party has found it easier to get their version of immigration reform done. Um, part of it is because that even when you have control, usually it's especially of late, it's been slim majorities. And slim majorities mean it's much harder for the majority party to keep all of their people in line and then somehow get a few of the other party on board uh, to get something passed. Um, if there is a 60 vote requirement in the Senate, that's a higher bar to pass. And what we have found is that even in, even in the party, you know, the Democrats may have a, a slightly, you know, sort of more uh, homogenous point of view on immigration than they've had in the past. I think there are still a pretty wide variety of opinions from the far progressive left to some of the moderate seats that will swing their way in, a, in an election to try to get everyone on board. And then you get into, frankly, a math problem in Congress of every additional person you try to get on the other party side, you may lose somebody from your, you know, uh, far left base. And the same has been true on the Republican side. So I, I firmly believe, and I do work for a place called the Bipartisan Policy Center, so I got to put this plug in, that our best bet for getting immigration reform done is to stop trying to figure out how we get it to be all party and just enough of the other party to be on board. We have to look at what the majority is going to get us, and the majority is bipartisanship from the middle. We have to look at what the public will support, and we have to be able to move forward on something. Because trying to get the perfect, and every side defines perfect their own way, at, has been at the expense of getting something done. And I think we need to figure out how we, how we do that better. So uh, with due respect to my colleague, I, I have to put in the push for bipartisanship because I really think that's where we need to get to in this country. We need to get back to that kind of conversation. Thank you. Well, I really wish we could continue this conversation. It's been very interesting for me uh, and for everyone, I'm sure, who's been listening in. So unfortunately, our time is up for today. I hope people will continue the conversation via email. Uh, we do have our report out. It's up on the screen where you can download it. And if you do have any particular questions about our report or any other aspect of immigration law or policy, you can email me or Mac at cornell.edu. With that, we'll sign off. And thanks again to all of our panelists and to Cornell and to the Koch Foundation for this stimulating discussion. Thank you. <laughs>